And I think that's a point I wanted to make, because often when we talk about aid, there is pressure to come up with very short-term judgments about whether it's working perfectly now. But social and economic progress does not always occur at a rapid rate, but things, are, things do change, things can improve. I'm sure Slovakia is not yet the land of milk and honey and uh, perfect in all ways, but certainly looking back over 34 years, it looks like it's come an extraordinary uh, long way. And, you know, the humanity does have this capacity when, it gets, when, it, when enough people get together, move in the right direction to improve social conditions and to improve economic conditions. And I'm glad to see that's been happening um, in, in this part of Europe while I've been away from it. Um, I was thinking of doing a sort of a, a general talk about foreign aid and evolution of foreign aid and what's happening with this idea of global poverty now. But uh, it, instead of doing that, I thought that I'd talk about uh, an, another book that I've just produced recently, which focuses on what I see as a development success story. And um, I, I've uh, termed this Just Give Money to the Poor, and there is a book called Just Give Money to the Poor. We've put one in the university library upstairs, and I think I can leave one for the NGDO platform uh, behind. But if any of you are interested in what I'm talking about, then if you go to the website, we can't actually put the book on the website, because that would upset the publishers. <laughs> but you'll find many parts of the book, and particularly summaries of the book that are much shorter, are available on the Brooks World Poverty Institute website if, um, if you are interested um, in that. Can I just pop those down there? Okay, let's, um, let's move on to the last 10, 11 years. Uh, relatively few people have seen the way in which this idea of cash transfers, and particularly this broader concept of how do we provide social protection for our populations, this has been slowly spreading um, across the world. Um, it's not mentioned, the Millennium Development Goals of 2000 and 2001 didn't mention social protection, didn't mention cash transfers in any of the main headlines. But by 2010, when the Millennium Development Goals Plus 10 meeting was held in New York, then there were frequent references to the need for cash transfers, to having social protection, social platforms for populations. And so this is an idea which, in a way, has gradually filtered in over the last... Uh, 10 years. There are now at least in, in developing countries in Asia, Africa, Latin America, around 110 million families uh, in at least 44 countries who are receiving cash transfers and it's really built up rapidly. My colleague and co-author Armando Barrientos who counts the numbers for us, he's actually traced that at least 750 million people, if you look at how many beneficiaries that you, there are and you look at the size of the households, at least 750 million people are benefiting in low-income and middle-income countries from cash transfers. And China is rapidly expanding what it's doing with cash transfers now, so it may be 1 billion people in, uh, in, in low-income and middle-income countries are benefiting from these schemes. But the important thing to note is that in many ways the pressure, the impetus to practice, first of all, to experiment with these types of cash transfers and then to expand the cash transfers and then to export knowledge has not come from aid donors and has not come from the rich world. It's come from what we can call the global south, particularly in South Africa, Brazil, Mexico and India, more recently Indonesia and China and now a lot more countries are introducing these programs. And so what I was going to talk about today is that very much the need for aid, when we look at roles of foreign aid, is not necessarily to come up with the ideas and push good ideas down the throats of low-income country governments or middle-income country governments, but it is to look at what is working and help countries rapidly expand and improve programs which they are committed to. Um, and the final point to make on this is, as with most things in life, but particularly with aid, it does get complicated when you start to look at things in any detail. To help progress this cash transfer, this social protection agenda, then we have to think technically. We have to think about the finances, we have to think about the program design, we have to think about the administration of service delivery, but also it's necessary to think politically, because 
to get countries to go ahead with these schemes, one has to make sure that there is a political constituency. Not just that these are schemes that are effective, but also these are schemes which local democracy is supporting, which fit into local political processes and help to strengthen those political processes uh, too. Um, I used to teach in, in, in secondary schools, in high schools, so I always try and tell people what I'm going to tell them and then I tell them what the message is, and then I finish off telling you again. So I give you the message in the beginning, and so this, this is what you're going to, going to hear. Uh, and I can summarize what I've got in terms of four findings, two debates, and five principles. The findings are that recipients use money well. There is an enormous amount of academic and scholarly and evaluation evidence that when People in low-income and middle-income countries, particularly poor people, get cash transfers, often only small sums of money, maybe $2, maybe $5 a month, then they use that money well. It's summarized sort of in the book that we've got, but if you want to really look at our website, then we've done lots of academic papers and all the stuff in the econometric journals. The book is a, a popular summary of everything, but the academic base for this is becoming stronger and stronger. So recipients use money well. It's also a very efficient mean of, means of reducing poverty in the short term. But the evidence indicates that one can achieve sort of poverty goals in the short term. One can increase household income, one can improve, um, uh, re reduce hunger and improve nutrition in households. One can uh, perhaps get uh, children going to school. But there are also long-term benefits, and this is the third message, that when you start to look at human development, at what's happening with literacy, with the stature, with the physique, the actual physical well-being of children and of populations, then effective cash transfers can help with that longer-term contribution. Arguments that they can contribute to economic growth, especially making growth more pro-poor than it might have been, and in a way, not, not, not conclusive information, but certainly some evidence that it can help with the political evolution of countries, and it can help to bind populations together to get the elites in countries to think about the needs of uh, low-income and poor people, and to think about the way in which the state might be able to uh, use its resources more effectively. Um, um, and then the final uh, finding is about affordability. One of the common things that is said about cash transfers is they're a really nice idea, but poor countries can't afford cash transfers. And our arguments indicate that, no, it, they can be afforded, perhaps afforded on a very modest scale, on a very small scale to spot, start off with, but if you start off these sorts of programs, then you can develop them over time, um, particularly if a country suddenly finds oil as has happened in Uganda and Ghana at the moment, where we can look on how we can use those natural resources to expand um, cash transfer schemes, and that might be a very effective use of them. There are two debates then, these two debates that I've got in the middle, about conditions and targeting. And these are debates because there is lots of evidence indicating that putting conditions on poor people, making them send their children to school, making them take their children to the clinic to get inoculations, to get weighed, that that's good. But there's also plenty of evidence showing that conditions can be bad, that it simply pushes women to take their children to a health center, but there's no nurse there. There's no vaccine to be vaccinated with. So all you're doing is creating extra work for a woman and not doing anything. And similarly with targeting, there's evidence indicating that targeting can reduce what's got to be spent, can ensure that the most needy may benefit um, from a cash transfer, but there's also evidence that indicates that targeting can be bad. For example, when a whole village in Africa thinks that most people are poor and most people are just, their incomes are going up and down, then targeting some people because you did a survey on one day that says they appear to be poorer can actually cause people to fall out with each other. Because six months later, when the cash transfer is coming, 
maybe those households are no longer the poorest in the village and somebody else is poorer. So the evidence on those needs to be debated and we argue that you have to think very contextually. You have to think about the country and the locality and the objectives of a programme. And some kind of conditions will be good, sometimes um, they will be a bad idea. Sometimes targeting is desirable, sometimes it's not as desirable. Finally, what I'll finish off are these five principles, which is what we do in the book. We try to squeeze together everything that we can find in the evidence base, and we argue that if we want these programs to go ahead, then they need to be fair. People have to believe, particularly at the local level, that, that these are just, that the right people are getting resources. They have to be assured. This is not about temporary transfers because of a moment of crisis. They have to be assured that while people are in certain social and economic conditions, they will continue to get the transfers. They need to be practical. You have to find ways of delivering these cash transfers, and that can be very challenging, particularly if you look at uh, low-income African countries where the public service, the public administration is not very effective, then it's quite difficult. But there are ways of making these schemes practical. Um, we've said just sent, not just sense, but these, the sums of money transferred don't have to be big, but they do have to make a difference. We, as I'll talk about at the end, around about 20% of a poor household's income can make a very big difference. So just giving people a few cents won't make a difference, but giving people a few dollars, that may make the difference. And finally, they've got to be popular in political terms. They've got to be something which politicians, particularly in emerging democracies, find that they can fit into their policy platforms and that uh, get support from poorer people, but also get support from middle class and from elites. Let's go into some of the detail now. What is a cash transfer? Well, basically, cash transfers are payments which are regular. People get them on a regular basis, usually monthly in most parts of the world. They're long term. People can expect to get them for a few years or maybe for a whole phase of their life. If you're getting a, an old age pension, then you should imagine that that is going to continue through until, uh, un until you have passed away. They need to be rights based. People need to know that they can, they're actually entitled because of the particular social or economic position that they're in, that they're entitled to having the cash transfer. It shouldn't just be charity. Oh you've got a problem, we'll give this to you now. It shouldn't be discretional that some public administrator can just decide who gets them and who doesn't give them. It needs to be rights-based and it needs to be tax financed. Ideally, it needs to be financed from the domestic tax of a country and certainly uh, in Africa, where many people think resources are scarce, then there are eight or nine African countries that are putting their domestic taxation into cash transfers, and so we think this is something that's very desirable. But sometimes in low-income countries, it will be necessary for donors to provide support, and so donors can help in establishing these schemes and in financing them in the early years. And basically what this means, I mean, if any of you are scholars of social protection, is the emphasis uh, in low-income and middle-income countries is on social assistance. Social insurance has a role. We also need to think about labour market regulation. But the main argument that uh, I and colleagues make in the book is that it's a social assistance approach that is particularly appropriate at the moment. So what are these types of cash transfers? Well, the common types are social pensions or non-contributory pensions. Pensions that people are entitled to get simply because they've reached the age perhaps of 60 or 65 or 70. They haven't contributed to those pensions. It's a pension which the state will provide them with. I'll talk about some examples of this in a second. Child benefits or child support grants are another common one. They've been common in many parts of uh, Europe, but in Southern Africa at the moment, in seven Southern African countries that are concerned about uh, child development and about what's happening to the, the children in those countries, then they've moved in for granting child benefits. Sometimes there are family grants. Usually these are targeted, and usually there is a device which tries to identify the poorest families or the poorest households and then they get a grant for a number of years to try and help them improve their position. Disability allowances, again common in many parts of Europe but these are used in across many countries in Africa and across many countries in Asia. 
And there are also cash for work programs, but schemes where people who cannot get employment, uh, if they come and work on public works, on building roads, on building embankments to keep uh, the sea out, then they're paid cash for them. And increasingly in Asia, these schemes are rights-based. In India, every person living in a rural area can claim 100 days labor from the government if they cannot find employment. So they know they can get an income as long as they'll work for it. And the government has to work out what public works programs uh, it could take forward. Let's give a couple of sort of country case studies um, of these. I, I can talk about others when we have the questions and answers if, if you want. South Africa is the sort of African lead on these cash transfers. And particularly it has a social pension and child benefits. Around 2.3 million people, about 85% of people aged over 63, get the social pension. They haven't contributed to a pension, but they receive the pension because they're a South African citizen who's reached the age of 63. The only people who are screened out of that are people who've already got a pension. Public servants get pensions, so they don't get this social pension, and many people who've worked in the, uh, in the private sector, particularly in the mining industry, have pensions. But 85% uh, of uh, over 63-year-olds get them. Um, child benefits are the other important program in South Africa. That's expanded massively over the last four years. Now 8.5 million children receiving them, which is about 55% of all children under the age of 16. Um, it's means tested, you have to come from a poor family, and so there is targeting of this, uh, of this cash transfer, but it's unconditional. It, once you get the cash transfer, then you haven't got to go to school or got to go to the health centre. Um, this adds up to quite a lot of, uh, of money. It's 80 billion uh, rand, which trying to work things out in euros is probably looking at 800 million euros. It's a large sum of money. 3.5% of, of uh, South Africa's GDP. Um, but, as I'll talk about in a minute, there are substantial benefits that have been um, seen to come from this. Benefits in terms of reducing poverty in the short term, but also benefits in terms of ensuring that children can reach their full mental and intellectual uh, capacities. This model is diffusing across uh, the Southern African region. And again, I'm going back to aid, donors looking at helping countries in southern Africa to reduce poverty would do well to recognize that this is a political process, that politicians in South Africa talk with politicians in Namibia, Lesotho, Botswana, Mozambique, and many other countries, and that the role of aid can be to help those conversations to move forward and to help um, well-designed elements of, uh, of initiatives based on those conversations to move forward. And so we've got the social pensions at the moment in Namibia, in Lesotho and Botswana and other countries in South Africa looking at whether they should introduce uh, these pension schemes. I should say that these, these schemes are very good for reducing poverty. I think they contribute to South Africa's long-term development but they're not enough in themselves. South Africa has an enormous problem with not generating employment. And so I'm not suggesting that these cash transfers can solve South Africa's problems. We also need quite fundamental changes in its macroeconomic and its, its actual economic structure. We need to reduce inequality if we're going to generate the levels of employment that South Africa needs. But the cash transfers make it more likely that we can have a population that could take on jobs when those jobs are created. Brazil is the other sort of famous um, example that's come out of the, uh, out, out of the 2000s. Um, and there are two main grants that, that, that one can point to um, in Brazil. There's the Bolsa Familia, the family grant, which goes to 11.6 million families, around a quarter of the entire population. That's targeted and that goes to families that have a per capita income which is under 30% of the minimum wage. So that's a targeted um, device, and there are conditionalities around that. So this is one of these conditional cash transfers which the World Bank has particularly taken an interest um, in in recent years. Um, so that's an example of these conditional cash transfers. But as with South Africa, some Cash transfers are not conditional, and we'll talk about that as a debate in a minute. The social pension recently introduced goes to 6.6 .6 million older people. 
And when one looks at Brazil, 39% of the population is now getting a cash transfer. That's 1.5% of its uh, gross domestic uh, product. That, on average, for a recipient household is around $10 to $90 um, a month. Um, not a lot of money, but not an insubstantial amount of money, quite clearly, for those who are getting $90 a, a month. Probably the postscript just to mention about Brazil is if, that if you want a development success story over the, uh, uh, over the 2000s, then it's Brazil that, uh, that one would look at. Brazil has had excellent economic growth over the last 10 years. Inequality has reduced in Brazil, and people used to think that you could never reduce inequality in Brazil. It was always the example of the world's most inequality, and poverty has reduced. So the last 10 years, it's actually had growth, inequality has reduced, um, and also poverty has reduced. Um, and certainly according to some of the statistics, some of the problems of violence and law and disorder have reduced. So let's move on then from those examples to go into a bit more detail about some of the results of these studies. The poor use money uh, wisely, mainly on the family. There are benefits for the next generation. Um, and it does not discourage work. It's just the opposite. I've put this sort of thing about rich and poor are really different. Well, whether that's a bit too crude to express it. But many people who are well off say it's a really stupid idea to give poor people money because they'll sit down and drink beer and not work. But the evidence that I'm going to present suggests that perhaps there are some cases, and perhaps in, in some particular context this can be a problem, but that the evidence which is emerging increasingly shows that no, one can trust poor people to use the money uh, well. Let's start off with these short-term benefits in terms of the findings. <clears throat> Lots of evidence that, uh, that, that these cash transfers reduce poverty in the short term. Um, the grants are used by the whole family. This is um, something that comes out again and again, particularly when you look at pensions for old age people, but also in terms sometimes of child support grants. When a household, when a family gets a cash transfer in, then quite often it thinks, how do we fit this into what we're doing across the whole household? It's probably the South African pensions that are the most famous on this, but when an old age pensioner in South Africa gets a pension, you generally find that the children's nutrition in that family improves, that the children are more likely to be going to school, and that if you've got educational tests, the children are more likely to be increasing their literacy or improving their numeracy. And so one thing that we find is that, in a way, even if you think you're targeting old age pensioners and trying to take care of them, the benefits actually can spill over to other members of the household. And particularly that in most households, there is a real desire to make sure that my children's life is better than my life, is better, my grandchildren's life is better than my life. And that this means that there's a focus when these cash transfers go, in, go, go into a household and trying to work out how can we use them uh, for the children. Around half of the money uh, in most of the, many of the studies that have been done goes into having more food and having better food, getting a greater variety of food and also increasing the calorific uh, uh, increase. Children are taller and healthier with increased school attendance and more learning in pensioner families, in, in Bolsa Familia families, in child support grant families um, in South Africa. Um, some of the very detailed studies that have been done in South Africa, in Brazil and Mexico can actually tell you whether it's a half a centimetre or a centimetre that a child will be taller after a cash transfer has operated for 10 years in a household. But you can actually see the difference physically in children where cash transfers go. They, they do actually reach more of the potential that they've uh, got. The likelihood of stunting and wasting is much lower. And more broadly, in social terms, these cash transfers, if well designed, can contribute to reduced inequality. We get uh, income is, is less unequal, food consumption is uh, likely to be less unequal, access to education becomes, uh, in a way, something that the general population is getting to. But we can also see these benefits in terms of contributions to long term growth and development. Um, again, it's particularly South Africa one can point to with this. Usually, when poor people in low-income households get cash transferred to them, they spend it locally. And in most low-income and middle-income parts of the world, you tend to get poor households concentrated in certain parts of a city or in certain rural regions. 
and simply spending money locally is good for the local economy. It means that other poor people can sell their products, can provide their services, are likely to be able to get employment uh, in that economy. Poor people don't buy luxury imported goods. They buy low-cost foods that are produced locally. They buy uh, sandals that are made from, coal, uh, from, from car tires that have been discarded locally by somebody who's just got a knife. And so it feeds into the local economy. In pure economic growth, aggregate growth terms, it's quite small. But this is pro-poor growth. This is creating small increases in income, small increases in demand for labour for poor people. And it's particularly in rural South Africa, where many parts of rural South Africa are stagnant at the moment, but the pensions and the child support grants help to provide, help to keep the economy ticking over, help to uh, permit people to make a living and to stay on there, rather than simply having to give up and move into the already overcrowded uh, cities. Again, studies show variations, but parts of grants are usually invested for some productive activity. Um, an average of 10 to 15 percent comes out of the studies that Armando Barrientos and I have looked at, but that varies. In some parts of the world, it can be 50 percent of a cash transfer is used as an investment. In other parts of the world, then it's a much lower uh, element. Classic examples are for fertilizer, for seed, and goods for sale. Again, if you look in rural South Africa, if you track old age pensioners who are getting an old age pension, then when you ask them what they've done with it, some of it goes into food immediately, some of it will probably be used to make sure that the children stay in school, that they get the, the shirt that will allow them to go to school, even if the schooling is free, you still need money to send a child to school, but some of it will go into fertilizer or seeds, and it helps to keep the rural economy uh, more productive. And then finally, there's evidence, again, this is South Africa, that it encourages job seeking. That actually households that get a cash transfer don't move out of the labour market. They put more hours a week <coughs> into trying to find um, a job. And quite simply, that's often because bus fares weren't available. Often a household couldn't afford a bus fare so that an unemployed member of the household could go and try and get a job in the city centre. Now that you've got a small pension coming in, then you can use part of that pension to pay the bus fare to see if I can find a job um, in the city centre. Um, I've used a, an English phrase here which probably isn't, isn't very good. Again, as I said, some people sort of say cash transfers would make people lazy. Well, no, the argument is, as we said in English, you can't pull yourself up by your bootstraps um, if you have no boots. But maybe there's an easier uh, analogy that I can uh, use for that. Uh, some years ago, one of our very conservative politicians said, the problem with poor people in Britain is they won't get on their bikes. <coughs> and what he meant by that is they haven't got a job, and they just stay at home waiting for a job to come to them. But if they got on their bikes, then if they looked, they'd find one. And in a way, what comes out of this is, yeah, but if you haven't got a bike, it's very difficult. Now, maybe if it's within walking distance, you can get to that job. But if you could afford a bike or a bus fare, <coughs> then you could actually take a job further away. And so this is not, um, uh, not claiming that cash transfers in a way would solve problems of unemployment, but it makes it easier for... Oh, thanks very much. It makes it easier for people to um, energetically uh, pursue um, jobs. Poor people often have the best knowledge about what's available in terms of employment or in terms of small enterprise or micro enterprise uh, in their region and they lack uh, the cash to be able to invest in those opportunities. But it's also important to notice that these cash transfer schemes help to reduce risk aversion. Um, poor people are very concerned about taking on risk because if you take on risk and things go wrong, then when you have to move to a fallback position, particularly if you're poor and you've got no other assets, then you're in a very vulnerable uh, position. Households that are getting cash transfers can think about taking small risks, can think about ways that they could try to increase their income, uh, increase their productivity. They can think, shall I get a new crop? They will also think, could I take on a microcredit? Could I take on a loan? Because even if the business I'm running has problems with that loan, I've got a little bit of cash coming in so I can keep on paying that loan, so I won't get into trouble uh, because of being in debt. So risk is a really enormous problem for poor families. Um, 
A poor family, if it's thinking about changing its crop, has to think, will my family go hungry? Will they even starve if I try a new crop and it fails? The new crop might give me twice the yield, but if I borrow money to pay for the seed and fertilizer and we don't get any rain, then I have no food and I'm in debt and I'm going to be chased to pay that debt back. Should I risk buying fertilizer? As in Zimbabwe um, in December last year, in a terrible dilemma that uh, households were facing there, they'd planted their crops, they put down fertilizer in November, the rain had come and the crops had started to, to come up, but then the rains had stopped. And three weeks later, the crops had died. Now, it's still the rainy season. You can buy more seed, you can buy more fertilizer. But if you buy that and the rain doesn't come back or the rains are bad, then you're actually, you've borrowed money twice for no purpose. And so this dilemma of taking a risk. If I don't buy fertilizer, I won't get much of a crop, but I buy it and the rains don't work out. So cash transfers can allow people because they can see even if things go wrong, I've still got a small sum of money coming in. We've got a way of surviving. Can we afford the bus fare to go and look for a job? So cash transfers give a, a guarantee of a small future income and that permits poor households to take risks. In other words, a form of insurance against taking risks when they're looking at, uh, at, uh, at improving their productivity. Microcredit um, has to be repaid if your crop fails. It's less risky to take on uh, microcredit or micro debt if you've got a cash transfer and that. In the 1990s I worked a lot on microfinance. I think microfinance can be good, but microfinance makes life riskier for poor people. These cash transfers reduce risk, and so they have many additional benefits. Now, if you're a, an a donor or a politician thinking about moving into cash transfers, encouraging these, then you might want to think in a way about a, a number of assumptions, and you would be asking yourself, are these assumptions valid. You'd certainly want to be saying, is poverty partly caused by a lack of predictable income? And the evidence that's emerging says, yes, that's the case. Not having some sort of minimum income in the future reduces the ways in which people can engage with the economy. It makes it more difficult for them to think about what they could be doing uh, more productively. You have to ask, are opportunities available or are people trapped in poverty? This varies from context to context, but certainly in many contexts, then, opportunities are available. I'm probably fortunate because the last 22, 23 years, the country I specialize in, in Bangladesh. And in Bangladesh, because we've had steady economic growth, 4, 5, 6%, then there are opportunities. When poor people there get a cash transfer, they can think about all sorts of things that they could, uh, could be doing in the economy with that, ways they could change their activities. And then you've also got to ask this question is, is giving people money, is it ethically right? And is it politically feasible? And these are questions which national governments in developing countries have to ask themselves. And it's also questions which um, aid donors have to ask themselves. I was just going to divert onto the rich world for a second when we think about this. Often what happens when that question is asked is, is it right, is it, is, is it ethically right to give uh, poor people cash transfers, then it depends really upon the analysis in countries about what's happening uh, in, the, in, in their country. And these, these are figures asked by the World Values Survey about why are people in need in your country? And one finds very big differences in this. In the USA, then, 61% of people, this is in a 2008 survey, said poor people are poor because they're lazy. Only 39% said it's because society um, is unfair. At the opposite end, then, actually, in Germany, uh, we had the, uh, the reverse result. Germans didn't blame people for being poor. Only 13% of the population said it's laziness that caused poverty. They said it's an unfair society, unfair economy. It's the fact that jobs aren't available, that people can't get the education they need to do the jobs. Now, these national characteristics often feed into what happens in a country. The USA doesn't like cash transfers very much because people assume that 
they'll go to lazy people. In Germany, uh, as in many other Western European certainly countries, it's easier to talk about cash transfers because people believe that it's structural problems that are uh, stopping people from moving forward. It's not simply that they're uh, being lazy. These national attitudes actually impact upon ideas about aid. And one finds if one looks at US foreign assistance that it is relatively suspicious of, uh, of cash transfers. Whereas Germany, along with the UK, tend to be the two countries which are promoting a cash transfer agenda amongst the, uh, the international community. I don't know where Slovakia rates on this, but certainly those of you sort of in the NGDO platform um, would want to think about where it is and the way in which national perspectives on what's happening. People tend to assume that the analysis they have of poverty in their nation applies to Africa uh, and, and Asia. Um, so one does need to think about these things and think about the way that domestic policies and attitudes fit into these, uh, these ideas. If you look actually at what's happening in, um, in the South, and by that I'm meaning in developing countries, then you find that actually middle classes and elites are changing the attitudes. Um, this is talking about the middle class and elites in India, in Bangladesh where I work, two countries where the middle class has grown massively um, over the last 10-15 years because of economic growth, but also um, in Brazil, uh, in parts of South Africa. There's increasingly a rejection of growth is enough, that economic growth will take care of everything, that the poor are lazy, that we cannot afford welfare or social protection. And there's an increasing consensus that if we want to have national development, we need to have growth, but we need to have human development. We need to make sure that the children of this generation are healthy, are well-nourished, are educated, and we also need to have human security. We have to make sure that people feel reasonably secure, that they could take a risk, they could try to take a new job, they can try to make a new business, and they don't feel that that risk would ruin their lives if it fails. The 1997-1998 financial crisis showed this, and particularly showed the need for social protection for countries such as uh, Indonesia, Thailand and Vietnam that were at the heart of the 1997-1998 financial crisis, found at that stage that they needed social protection. <coughs> at first they talked about social safety nets and temporary protection, but if you look at the fallout from the financial crisis of 2008, then you find that Indonesia coped with it very well, partly because it had introduced a social uh, protection, a, ca a long-term cash transfer scheme, and that meant that there was already some protection in for when the crisis hit and they had a program operating so that if they wanted to do something emergency they could build it on the existing program uh, that was there. It can be part of emerging domestic democratic processes, certainly this is what one is seeing in, in southern Africa, in parts of India where the government has introduced the National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme but also old age pensions. I also find it's the case in Bangladesh where I work. Governments in Bangladesh of whichever major party have been introducing old age pensions and pushing old age pensions. And until a couple of years ago, the donors kept clear of them. Oh, they can't afford old age pensions. Really stupid thinking, because this was something around which the Bangladeshi democratic process was united, that we should have small old age pensions for people. It was the way of starting off, in a way, a social protection system that could be built into some sort of more all-encompassing welfare system as wealth in Bangladesh uh, grows. And now donors are recognizing, no, we don't need to transplant our ideas from outside. We can look at what local democratic processes are generating and see if we can provide support uh, for those. Um, the poor, in a way, are proving to be good economists. They know how to manage this money. And the cost of social protection, varying from half a percent to two percent of GDP in most of the countries where it's being pr uh, practiced, um, can be afforded. There are ongoing debates, and I'll just talk quickly about these, about conditions and uh, about targeting. The debates about conditions are getting more and more complicated because people talk about conditions, but they also talk about co-responsibility and about what services should we attach to cash transfers. And there are 
arguments uh, for cash trans uh, for conditions, arguments against them. In Mexico, one has highly conditional programs. In South Africa, then, programs that are unconditional. The case for them is that you can improve the long-term impacts and you can change the culture of certain social groups that are seen as having a culture of poverty if you put conditions um, on the grants. Uh, you can also get your middle classes and elites to buy into cash transfers with conditions because they can say, yes, we can see that poor people are going to have to change these behaviours we don't like. But against them you can see uh, paternalism is being argued and often if services are not very good it's no good telling a woman to take her child to a health centre. It's only if the services are available it's worth attaching those as conditions. These are some examples, I won't go through them, through them in detail, but you find that often donors and sometimes academics have a fundamentalist position. They say conditions must always be there or conditions must not be, uh, be there. But one finds in countries they're much more pragmatic. Some programmes will have conditions around them, some will not. And one needs to understand and appreciate the local sort of political and often democratic processes that discuss the way in which things uh, w will operate. Ethiopia, a classic case. It has this productive social, uh, pr productive uh, social safety net programme which at its heart says that you can only give cash transfers to poor people if they work, but actually 25% of the resources are being given to households where there is no one who is capable of working. And so they've got them in a way as a non-conditional program. Um, I'll, uh, I'll leave the details on the targeting. Oh, well, that's the targeting. I'll, I'll talk about it. When you look at targeting, then, again, there are, there's a case for it. If you target, then you can give the money to those who need it most. And... There's also a philosophical question that can be asked is, if you go for a universal grant, should you be giving money to rich people? Is, is that poverty reduction? If you say, this should be universal, we give it to everybody. But against it is that it's very hard to do accurately. It can be very divisive at the local level. It can lead to neighbours falling out, because you've got it and I haven't, but our position is almost identical. Um, it creates opportunities for corruption, because it makes cash transfers more complicated, and it leads to uh, additional administrative costs. So on targeting, we'd also arguing, argue that one needs to avoid the argument that there must be targeting or there must not be targeting. You need to look at the local context. I'll leave some of the debate out on that and move to the conclusions. The five principles for success that we argue you find if you look across all of this evidence. The first thing is that cash transfers have to be seen as fair. Most citizens must agree that the people who are getting these grants are the people who should be getting those grants. And this is when we find categorical targeting is particularly effective. In many parts of the world, there's a broad consensus that older people need <coughs> to get grants and that children need to get grants, and in some parts of the world, that the poorest households need to get grants and that people with disabilities need to get grants. But it needs to be seen as fur. If it's not fur, then it can lead to disputes and problems and social tensions at the local uh, level. It needs to be assured, if you want people to change their medium and long-term behaviour, they have to know the money will be coming in. That money may be coming on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis, or perhaps on an annual basis. But they have to know it's coming, and then they don't see it just simply as a social safety net, they see it as something that will allow them to change their behaviour in the longer term. It needs to be practical, you have to be able to deliver it. But that is getting easier and easier, even in uh, low-income Africa, with the uh, use of mobile uh, telephony nowadays, with the private sector retail uh, operators who are uh, working in rural areas, uh, using post offices, using uh, weekly markets, there's a whole set of ways in which one can set up innovative uh, delivery programs. India uses its post offices. South Africa uses weekly markets and uh, an armoured vehicle brings the old age pensions and the child support grants into that area and then you've got the local market, the health workers are there uh, and a whole set of other government services are there. In Kenya they're experimenting with using mobile phones to transfer the money um, to households. So there's a whole set of uh, things there. It needs to be more than a few cents, and we find that once one's getting to around 20% of a poor household's income, that allows long-term decisions to be changed. That often is only three, four, five dollars um, in some contexts, and they've got to be popular and politically acceptable. Politicians have
have to support them, we have to get middle class and elite support. Partly so that they work now, but also that they become part of an evolving social policy framework. They shouldn't just be a single programme, this is social policy evolving. So cash transfers work. They provide immediately poverty reduction, um, it increases investment, it impacts on the next generation, it can stimulate local economic growth and investment, it can be a small step on the way to thinking about national welfare systems, um, and it may, we wouldn't say that definitely, but it may add to processes of improving governance, of moving towards good enough uh, governance. It rebalances expert advice, what technical specialists, particularly aid specialists, think poor people need, with poor people's choices and knowledge. It gives them the money and they can decide whether to use it for food or education or health or micro-enterprise. And so, you know, the message is just give money to the poor, not out of helicopters or as charity, but as carefully designed programmes deriving from national decision-making and experience. And there is a role for donors and international agencies in this, but it's in supporting cross-national learning, helping countries across Asia and Africa learn what is happening, um, helping those countries recognise affordability and joint financing programmes, particularly with low-income countries in Africa. And then finally, there's the book which argues, just give money to the poor. Thank you. <laughs>